Everybody got a copy? No, we can hear Okay, good. So I'm here to tell you about where we are in the uh, NAR after uh, last board meeting, which uh, was from <coughs> Thursday night through Friday and all done uh, Saturday morning, because we had lots of good stuff to do. I want to introduce those of uh, the, your officers and trustees that are still here. So I'm Ted Cochran, I'm the president. Uh, John Hockheimer's over here. Joyce Guzik had to leave early. Tom Ha is, there he is in the back. Uh, Ryan Coleman. I forget what happened to Ryan. And Vince had to leave early, I think. Oh, that's right. He, he, they told them to pick up a little early. Ed is here. Out of uniform. Uh, John Lingdahl is in the back. And Mark Wise. Also out of uniform. Also out of uniform. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Right, so these are the guys. <laughs> these are the guys that I rely on to do the stuff that you need to get done, so that you can fly, have insurance, uh, to have sex grants, all that stuff. So they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> so my my company and and I've tried to make it a um, I have it here. Um, we start off with a safety minute every meeting. And I use the same safety minute for these town halls because some of you follow me around the country, but lots of times it's a different group of people every time. So this is what I'd like folks to remember every single time you set up a range, go to fly, whether it's your backyard or anywhere else. You, if you keep the wind from one side or the other and you face your rocket, you are way safer than if it's coming from behind or coming in your face. So set it up so that the wind is cross range Aim your rockets somewhere so that if the parachute doesn't come out, they land and they crash in a safe place, and we will be much, much safer. So a good rule of thumb, five degrees, which is about one inch per foot of launch guide. So I mean, it's not that big of a deal. If you get a six foot launch guide, you're over six inches. That's the way to do it. Yes, sir. So uh, angling your launch rods or whatever device you're using straight up is no longer applied. So, so in a dead calm, when you do that, the, the dispersal pattern is a big circle around your launch rod, right? Yep. And if the parachute doesn't open, that circle could include you, right? <laughs> right. I mean, I'm, I'm primarily thinking about like uh, some competition contest. Well, so there's a the, the rule of there's the range safety officer and the flyer can negotiate about special conditions. So TARC teams is a good example. TARC teams, we like to aim them five degrees, but they may get to pick the, the half of the hemisphere that they get to aim at. But, but we want, we'd rather be safer than, than higher or safer than longer in a competition. So that's the rule of thumb. So how did we do? 2015 was a great year. Uh, our membership is at six, as of last night was 6,419. It has never been higher. So that's, that's a, that, what that enables us to do is all kinds of other services that you'll be hearing about. We're at 171 sections. Um, a good portion of that increase is TARC teams and SLI teams that are establishing sections in order to get insurance and um, what ends up happening, we've seen several of those turn into rocket clubs in high schools, which is exactly what we want. Uh, we have an extremely healthy financial position. <clears throat> we have a great magazine. We have record high power certification. I think we have more level threes than we've ever had. Um, <coughs> more level <coughs> twos than we've ever had. Hard boot. Rebooting. Good thing we have handouts, huh? Okay, story time. Now I think it's I think what we need to do now is tell the TV that we have a we'll try. Just keep going and say Daniel when you turn the page. Keep going and tell us what page to look at. Take it time. Well it's uh oh you just find it. Android. Um <laughs> As you read in the sport rocketry, we started an exhibit with the Museum of Flight, an official exhibit. Preparing recommendations. <laughs> that's really scary, guys. It wants us to watch a movie now. Dave, what are you doing? 
<laughs> you got more applause than trust me. <laughs> so we have, if you ever get out to Seattle, you should go to the museum of fight first because it's a great museum. But second, we've got a rocket that we did there. And it has some of the earliest artifacts from our history, some of the historical um, things that are that are really cool. The banner that flew on the space shuttle, um, the first rocket to hit 100,000 feet on the first motors. Uh, it's got all kinds of cool stuff, so I recommend you see that. That's our exhibit. We partnered with the Museum of Flight to establish it. Um, and you should go see it. It's a lot of fun. Liability insurance is now $5 million. And we also have uh, fire insurance for the fields that we fly on, which is um, something that no other association has, and it's very valuable. Some of our uh, field owners want $5 million now, so we said, okay, we'll do that. Membership dues, I, I don't know how broadly this has gotten around yet, but if you're 25 and under, your membership dues are $25. So we're trying to keep the college kids, um, it's, not, it's, it's not two cases of beer anyway, it's just one. Thank you. <laughs> and we continue to expand our new website. We have a huge section grants program, you'll be hearing more about that later. Uh, we have, um, continue to do our partnerships with TARC, with the AIA, and with NASA on the student launch program. Uh, with the AIA, we won the this year's uh, uh, Mervyn K. Strickler Award for Aerospace Education Leadership from the National Coalition for Aviation and Space Education. So that's a trifecta. We've won all of the major aerospace education awards in the last three years, right? One, one a year for the last three years. So we're going to start going back and get the first one over here. <laughs> Um, we've got, we now have a $35,000 education grant and scholarship fund. Um, so for our college members, there's a good reason to apply for this. So here's our membership graph. The little blue line, the little dotted blue line, every month, you know, there's people who don't be new and they fall off. So the very first day of the month is our lowest of the month. And then people renew or they join us and the number goes up until the end of the month when it's at the highest. So we're at the end of the month now, we're at 6419, and I expect we'll drop down to you know, maybe even below 6200 uh, the day after tomorrow, and we'll start climbing up again. So our membership tracks between those two graphs, but mostly up, yeah, and that's what we'd like it to do. We have about 5,100 senior members, we have about 700 leaders, 600 juniors, 700 leaders, that is awesome, um, and about 70 life members. About 30% of the new members are um, citing our member referrals or the vendor um, referrals. So that means that the membership referral, you get five bucks for everybody who puts your name on their membership application. That's working. <coughs> we have a diverse association, so this is a lot of age. Um, we always have the folks that, those of us that have been doing rocketry for a really long time are still getting older, unfortunately, 20 years time. Um, but we have this new um, big, Leader here um, is refreshing us as we go. So hopefully, <coughs> always be a gym because people get married and have kids and stuff. Imagine that. Um, but hopefully, we'll be we'll continue to feed our membership um, in future years from the leaders. Yeah. We have about 300 contest flyers. We have about 3,000 high power flyers, um, which is about 60 percent of those that are eligible to be high power flyers. Um, and you get the numbers there. We have more level one high power flyers than any other association. Um, and I think all of our level three members are also members of Triple A, very close to all. So it's kind of an interesting overlap between the two major associations. 325 teacher members, that program is, is Vince is doing a great job on that. 175 more teachers than we had just a couple of years ago. Um, and about 3,300 or 56% of our membership are members of sections, which is good. We'd like to get even more of that because being a member of a section is one way to um, anchor people into the NAR. Our finances are healthy, so we get about uh, 480, almost $500,000 in annual revenue. Um, we have pretty well executed budget. We have a hard time spending the whole budget because <coughs> one thing, for example, uh, I paid $10,000 for section grants and only get $5,000 worth of applications. 
So that money doesn't get spent, so we can carry it over to next year. So we have bunches of pools of money that we're trying to be conservative about, but you guys can certainly spend in the budget if you uh, want to be applying for all those grants that are available. Um, so this green line is sort of at the end of every month. I call up Tom Hahn and say, how much money have we got? And he says, yeah, $384,552.16. Put a little ball. So it goes up and down. The, the sawtooth, the big sawtooth that's getting bigger is the insurance every year. Um, and the other thing we've done is um, John has got a student launch program now as a contract. So NASA, get this, NASA pays us to make their launch of university rock, uh, student launch program rockets safe. We run that launch. So that's pretty cool. We get a bunch of checks come in and then we go do the thing and spend all the money in about April. So that's where these um, solitudes are in. But we had a little uh, reserve and we're in pretty good shape. And I'm just happy with that. Where does the money go? Well, if you look at income, it's dues, uh, advertising, the STEM grants are the um, NASA and mostly NASA and the AIA gives us uh, money for the target expenses that we do as well. Um, donations, uh, if you have a corporate donation matching program, you can, if you remember us, then we get that money and that's that pool. Uh, NARC sales and some other miscellaneous stuff. And the expenses, 15% is the headquarters expenses, how, what it costs to run the headquarters and the computers and Marie and that kind of thing. About 18% is for education now, which is the second biggest expenditure we have, which is appropriate for an educational 501c3 organization. 15% of our money is spent on insurance, 32% is printing, most of that is the magazine and the handbook. 3% on travel, 5% on section grants, 4% on competition and 2% on technology. That would be the website and things associated with running guns. And, and NEON. NEON is the database that we use to keep track of y'all. So our magazine is the best it's ever been. We're still paying $350 for the best articles, uh, uh, top quality, how to, technical articles. We do a little judging every issue and send out some checks. Um, and I think second prize mark is a, a year membership increase, right? Correct. Right. Um, our outreach programs are doing well. So this year is the 14th year of TARP. We have 701 teams, which I think is the most since 20 oh, since we started. It's actually 789. Okay. <clears throat> it is the most since the first I, year. I went back to first source. I thought they, had they, kept, they, kept, they, kept, they kept filing in. 789 is the most since the very first year we did it. So that, that program is um, getting its own legs now. So that's awesome. Which also means we have to keep supporting them. And this next couple of months is going to be it, right? We're going to be out there every Saturday helping these kids be safe and qualify. Um, SLI is also a progressive student launch. We changed the name once more. It's called NASA Student Launch. They have about 53 teams this year, um, of, uh, almost like 15-ish high school teams and the rest are universities. That's another cool program. That's getting bigger every year. And we have the Seattle Museum of Flight. That's what I talked about. That, that, we treat that as an outreach program, right? We're trying to draw people in with that part of it on the exhibit. That's what it is. Uh, I talked about the $35,000 Teacher grants, we started the new extracurricular grant. So we had these after school clubs, and it wasn't really a canon, which is using rockets in your existing teaching curriculum. But we wanted to also support these after school clubs. So there's a program for that now. Um, and the scholarship fund is up to um, 10 $2,000 scholarships. I think that's right. We're continuing to do the R&D prizes. Um, the R&D prizes were started by Bob Alway. There he is. Thank you very much, sir, for that. We're continuing to do the travel grants, um, and we're continuing to <coughs> look for other ways that we can be as um, outreach, outreaching as possible for what it is the Rock Creek Rainbow City. The website. So how many have been to the members-only side of the website? Good, so you're familiar with the fact that we're continuing to build that out. Um, we now have national <coughs> events websites. So it used to be, if you want to do a national event, 
say, oh, that means I got to negotiate with a hotel and I got to find somebody who knows HTML because I got a website up and I have. You don't have to do all that stuff now. We take care of the hotels and we'll negotiate with the hotels and find a great deal. And we'll also take care of the, uh, giving you kind of a, a template to set up your um, events. So all of the events this year are posted in our website with, with the same kind of template. Uh, NSL is up and running. NARAM is just getting started. Um, and you saw what we did with um, Narcon so far. All the R and D reports that have ever been all the R and D reports that have ever been done are now online, at least the ones that we can find um, in the members only section. So it's a huge body of pretty decent research on uh, model rocketry, sport rockets. Um, we are doing the competition um, uh, rule change process. The the Facebook changes rule changes. All that voting is online. We did that last year. That worked very well. It kind of doubled the number of people participating. We're going to uh, do that same thing with trustee voting starting this year. So starting this year, you will be able to vote for your do, do the trustee voting online, save yourself a 50 cent stamp. Um, it's not required, but it's optional. And if you, do, if you do that and that works well, next year we'll make it so that you can opt in and then we won't even send you the paper ballot because why should we spend the 50 cents? Um, and we'll put all the biographies and so on online. And then next year you'll be able to opt. It will end up being so that only the people who really want the paper ballots will get them. And that will take about three years to the transition. <coughs> um, the all the applications for grants and awards are online. Um, and we're this year we're just starting. In fact, I think um, Ryan threw the switch last night. And the first two years of old editions of magazines are now online as well. So we have. 1973, 1974 model rockets data. And we'll be adding those. We'll keep uh, until we get every magazine that we can find that's ever been published in our history, except for the last five years of sport rockets. Because we, we want to keep keep on sport rockets. So, also coming, um, if it hasn't already been done, we've got a contest only launch calendar. So, if you're looking for a contest, we sort, sort them that way. Uh, NARPS is going to have a brand new rollout with its own store and, you know, shopping carts and all the stuff that Amazon brought to us 10 years ago. So we'll figure that out. Um, and the NAR section renewal this year will also be available online. So instead of the old process, the new process will be the key contact point in the section will go to, a, to our website and essentially fill out an application and that will go into a, uh, a new database and that will allow us to manage section, section insurance, section contacts, launch sites much more uh, efficiently than we can do now. So what do we do in the last couple of, I, I do these for the last couple meetings in the past because um, lots of you haven't seen it before. So we are going to continue doing section grants on a continuous basis. Uh, they're not limited to safety items. <coughs> we have two pots of money. We've got uh, 10 grand for people, I think it's 10 grand, for people to do $250 applications. So whatever you, you know best, do you need a windsock? Do you need a bunch of flag line? Do you need a better PA system? Do you need a horn? Do you need a fire extinguisher? Um, I don't think we have ever turned one down. So you up to $250, you can apply to that, and there's an application online. There's another part of the stuff that everybody's been asking for, and we're gonna to try to get a um, larger discount by buying in bulk. So the fire, the, we'll find a brand of fire extinguisher for brush fires that works well to meet uh, Indian backpack pumps. Um, and we'll see if we can get 15 of them at half off, and then you can buy those too uh, from the NARC store. Discount. So we have some money in place for a program to see if we can do that. PA system is another one. We're going to try to design a PA system for small section that works, doesn't get um, shorted out with the first grade drop, uh, or doesn't break when you throw it in the back of the trailer. <coughs> uh, we raised the liability insurance that was last year. Um, we had we added twenty thousand dollars in scholarships. The end of last year and that's going to carry over to this year. Uh, we have a new teacher certification program for rocketry so if you're a teacher a lot of a lot of times your school district says you know they like, they, when I was a kid you could get thermite demonstrations in like high school right maybe even middle school if you had a good teacher. We, 
they can't do that anymore, right? Too dangerous. So rockets is getting that way. So we're going to try. We, our response is to try to make um, be able to have teachers have a certificate that says, "No, the National Association of Rocketry has gone through this course. I've been certified as a um, teacher in rocketry, and I want to add it to my classroom." Maybe the principal will say yes this time. We've started to uh, roll those certificates out. We've done half a dozen so far since the end of last year. Um, let's see. We raised the scholarship amount for our scholarships to two thousand dollars, and I talked about the extra activity grants. Um, lowered the dues. We did the Museum of Flight exhibit, and we did another round of kit stuffers. So the, the ST's kits that you get these days should have a little NAR stuffer in it, and we've been getting a decent response from that as well. We keep trying. Not one. There's no one magic bullet, but we keep trying all kinds of things to try to increase the membership and. Together, they're all working. I talked about back issues support rocket. Narcon is strong and growing. NSL, the attendance depends on where it is, but there's a pretty good demand for regional launches. Uh, NARAM is, is, has been historically flat to declining. It also a little bit depends on where it is. Um, we're looking at, so we, we had a, a long discussion about NARAM, and we were putting together a group to look at all of the national events and try to figure out how to make them as uh, useful as possible for members, as much of an attraction as we can, and as large as we can, uh, frankly, in order to get um, more rocketry coolness to all the members. So what we're going to end up doing is, um, there's a, uh, there's a committee that John Hockheimer is leading for national events, and there's a subcommittee that is leading on competition, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, I'll talk to right now. Contest rocketry has always been the, the core of what we do. It's how Lennar got started. I mean, Lennar got started to have contests in the and a lot of other cool stuff. That have there. Um, it's been a foundation for the technical advancement of rocketry in the field. It's been the primary source of challenge for people who don't or can't get into high power rocketry. So how do you know what new thing can you do? Well, I can make this rocket better and better and higher and higher or longer and longer or whatever. Um, and there's a core group of member enthusiasts uh, that have been doing contest rocketry since almost the beginning of time. But it's still been declining. It's still about 300 people um, and not and that's one of the smallest core constituencies within our association, and we would really like to grow it. Um, if you look at the, the statistics, this is uh, C division on top, and the others are kind of clustered in. Flat to declining, um, even though we've grown by 30%. So we're, we're having trouble attracting people to the idea of competition. I don't think it's the competition per se, because TARC is booming. We don't, we don't have trouble with that level. Um, but we do want to figure out if there are other ways of doing competition that attract more people. So we have this committee. Um, we established one for national events to talk about that John is going to be um, chairing. We have the subcommittee on competition by Ed McCoy. They had a interim report. It's a really neat concept, and they, we, we loved it, essentially. It's always little standing around some edges and things like that, but it was very positive discussion. It was the most enthusiastic and positive discussion on contest rocketry that I have ever participated in as an R member. That's how fun that meeting was. So you'll be hearing that. It's, they get, the committee's going to go back and work on some things and start blowing that out. And we expect um, by NARAM next this year, uh, that's July, to adopt and uh, the committee's recommendation. So we want to thank Ed and all the participants. He had a whole crew of people and helping them. It was awesome. Way to go. So we'll, um, I'm really excited about that. It'd be cool, it'd be really cool to have a thousand NAR members doing competition. And I think, I honestly think we can get there. Okay, so we're still paying $350 for support rocket through articles. Uh, we still have the High Power um, Rocket Science Achievement Award, so if you fly a rocket to a mile and you've documented it with an altimeter, uh, recording altimeter, send that in because uh, we have a web page with people flown to one mile, two mile, 
somebody put up a 22 mile flight, so that kind of took the. Sydney <laughs> 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 can beat him, but meanwhile, I go to a uh, uh, supersonic flight. There's a bunch of different categories of that. Okay. Um, we're still, if you, yes. If you do that with the model rocket, does it still count? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the whole point. <laughs> right. You can do both a mile high flight and a supersonic flight on the same rocket on the same flight. You got to get the altimeter in there, but um, yeah, that's entirely doable. Um, every every member that puts your number on their application, you get five dollars. I'm about ready to start to do that uh, that evening where I look like a drug dealer in my <laughs> living room with the five stacks of five dollar bills and filling labels and the stuff. What's really fun is going to the bank and saying, I need two thousand dollars and five dollar bills. Can <laughs> you wait here for a minute and come back? <laughs> um, now they get to know this. Oh, another bonus day. Um, those of you that have motors that are not currently certified, they're that they've been expired. Uh, we have a way you can fly those, and we can take the data and. We've got a lot of participation, but it's very broad and not very deep, and so we don't really have enough motors of any one lot yet to rescind their decertification for age. But we, in, in the long run, we could do that. If there were, like the MRC motors never fail, as near as I can tell, but we only got you know, 20 of them scattered over a bunch of years and a bunch of lots, and it, they're looking good, but if we had more of those, we could, let everybody fly them without this program. But if you want to fly them anyway, send a note to Steve Loveliners. He's still here. Okay, Steve Loveliners, um, our safety guy. His uh, email is on the website. Tell him what you want to do, where you want to fly. I think we set the standard uh, safety distance to double, and we don't let you fly them as um, sustainers on a um, two-stage flight. But there's a couple of instructions like that to keep it a little bit safer, but they're generally pretty good. Some of them do have more uh, Kato's than others, and they'll tell you if you can ask to buy one of those. So we can do that. Um, if you do have a Kato, motor motor or otherwise, please fill out uh, a quick form that we have up on motorkato.org, that website, because that's the only way we know, we can tell whether there's an issue, right? So we'll hear somebody say, you know, I flew a STD-12, and the whole pack was bad, and my buddy down the street says he had a bad pack the day before, and we go look at the statistics, and they look fine. So it's probably bad luck, or maybe you cooked them in your car and then froze them or something. But um, if we were to find, going back and looking at the statistics, Oh yeah, that whole batch, we've got lots of reports on that. We call Besties and say, what's going on? And so so there's an opportunity there for us to get the thing fixed before you blow up the ride. And the Facebook page, we have an our Facebook page with 4,190 people. It's pretty rigorously um, moderated, um, sometimes more rigorously than others, um, because I wanted to be a friendly, family friendly page where people talk about Rockets are not politics. Um, at least one place in the entire world can we talk about rockets. <coughs> um, and a lot of those members are from other countries, and they're not in our members, but we use that both as a recruiting tool and a way to find out what other people are doing. So that's fun. So my only primary concerns are please <coughs> don't fly rockets. So you really shouldn't be flying anyway. And I think we all know when we go out to a, a section lot or something like that, there's always that guy with that rocket, and the RSO says, um, just put it way out there and we'll call heads up. Why are we doing this? I mean, you know what's going to happen. Maybe it crashes where you expect it to crash, but maybe it'll come back and crash near us. We don't need to do that. So don't fly rockets that you don't need to fly. Um, if we, if our association were, had a major insurance claim, um, it, it would really affect us in the rates. We have, we pay some of the lowest insurance rates you can imagine for the kind of activity that we do, and it's because of our record. There was a fatality last year, uh, late last year, in a Boy Scout rocket, with a large model rocket, it wasn't high power, it was a large model rocket. The person got killed looking up and not seeing that rocket because he was watching a different rocket and it hit him right in the face. <clears throat> so this can happen. We wanted 
not to happen. We want your rockets to crash somewhere safe, not near us. Um, minor incidents happen a lot, so I don't think I had ever heard of a personal injury from a NAR um, launch from rocket flying before I became president, and there have been two so far in the four years I've been here. Um, one was a pyramid that, that popped off a rod, it was a very big motor and a very small pyramid that chuffed, popped off, landed on the ground and then lit, went screaming across and hit somebody in the leg and they got stitches, right? Um, another one was somebody not paying attention and a rocket didn't eject and came in and hit them. Um, again, we can't be too safe. The other thing that happens is people are parking under the rocket recovery area. I don't know why, but <clears throat> Couple times a year, somebody call up. I get an uh, email and says, you know, my rocket hit a car. Now what? And uh, you know, our insurance covers one thousand dollars deductible for you, uh, four thousand additional deductible for the section, and then we get the insurance company involved. And that it takes a really bad deal for a car to take uh, a damage beyond that deductible. So 99% of the time, you dink a hood in a car, somebody's brand new metal flame paint job, and you've just pumped it, it's gonna come out of your pocket. So if you think about it, don't let people park where the rockets are coming down, and don't fly your rockets so that they go to where the people are parking, and we can avoid all that. Next, priorities. We're gonna to continue to make for it, you're gonna hear for safety a lot, because that's what we have to do. Uh, we're going to be as broad as we can. Anything that's commercial, model rockets, level three, <coughs> contest rockets, high power, whatever, we're going to support. We're going to have um, as much breadth as we can in everything that's rocket power, even drones. We're going to increase our size as much as we can, members, sections, and then as the, as the membership size increases, we have more resources to support you in any way that um, makes sense. Headquarters support, section support, member support, about that order. We're gonna to continue to support and expand our outreach and educational efforts. We're going to be as open and transparent as possible, so board member meetings are open, the minutes will be out um, within a month. The, uh, E Rocketeer comes out. How many people read the E Rocketeer I send out every month? Good. So this is the core group that I'm not too worried about. It's the people who don't come to our events. That you got to, so keep talking, keep spreading it, spreading the good news. Um, continue to supply as much natural support to our sections as we can. So um, we got a good section manual that was put up. So thanks to Trip for that. Um, we have. There's many, a bunch of different partnerships. We've got 4-H, we've got the uh, civil air control, so we've got all the different ways. We still think we're the best value out there, $62 a year. If you're age 25 and under, it's only $25. we got a magazine, we got a great website. It's really solid, deep technical content. $5 million of insurance, including fire insurance, high power certification through level three, international and U.S. competition programs and a family member discount, $12. Keep going, recruit personally, make us as successful as we can be. But if you can fly safely, you can recruit, you can take your own turn volunteering. So we have a, uh, a volunteers page, volunteers needed page on the website. I'll put it up in the next year I can hear. Um, and when we have tasks, like maybe somebody else wants to have the fun of stuffing Five dollar bills and envelopes. <laughs> That's a volunteer task. I'll be happy to send you. If I could send you the cash in the mail. Really <laughs> <laughs> uh, Would it be safe? Uh, we'll figure out, yeah, you can send cash certified mail. But anyway, we, we figure out a way to do that. But there's lots of tasks like that. There's little tasks that are, you know just do it. I, I need somebody to spend three hours knocking this off. There's longer ones. I need somebody to get engaged on this problem and figure out. You know who's got the best deal and smoke. Uh, fighting backpacks and can we work with them to arrange a deal where sections can buy them and have them drop ship right to the section. I mean that's the kind of problem that needs to be solved. And then we have these long-term committee. Um, so you can participate as a volunteer in many different levels and we would really welcome you if you wanted to do that. Community outreach. So again, Mark had this rule, it's a 110-1 rule roughly. 
where you got to go expose Rockefeller to 100 people and maybe 10 people will get interested enough to ask questions or come to a launch and then maybe one would join. If you were really lucky, it's a 100. I think it's more like a 10,000, 1,000, 1, <laughs> But keep doing it, right? Because if you don't do it, no one's going to find out about it. So we love that. Um, and make sure everybody knows that we have all this stuff available to them, section grants. Ask your section. If you haven't gotten $250 this year, why not? We can afford to do it. So if you need something, make sure we get it from us. And the, and the bottom line is be safe, have fun, pay for it. Okay, questions? Comment. I have Lita's catwalk card with me. I'll be at the back of the room at the end of this if you have not signed it. Please do. Right. Which well is Lita? Tell me it's not a word. Other questions? Yes, sir, Bob. Stop the question. Do we have any data to indicate which kits are getting responses, whether they're skill level one kits, skill level four kits, or it's just it came from an Estes kit? Uh, the, the answer is, everybody heard the question? The yeah. answer is we don't have kit-by-kit kit data. Uh, we pretty much stuff them in everything. I think it's every kit that's not um, ready to fly gets one of those. Um, and we do track how well it's working. And so once, it took a while for the, we put 50,000, no, 500,000 um, stuffers and they're in the supply line, so they only hit the stores like mid last year, um, the first batch. So there's, there's this enormous supply chain of rockets working through the system. So we watch, if you watch the number of members who say yes, see this, how they join, or the number of people who send in the, um, who will go to the website that we have set up so we know that it's an Estes referral. It was track and track and track. There's always a bunch of people that started to go up last year. So now they are they are soon to be the number one referral company, um, having passed all the other deductions. So we know it's working, but we don't know which kids. Sure. So when I went out to SPs and negotiated to put stuffers in there, I went out there thinking, hey, skill level one, not our, not really our market. We ought to go for two and above. They said, no, we sell a hundred times more skill level one kits than all of the others put together. Bad idea. You should put it in all of them. Right. And so the, the numbers are overwhelmingly that they sell skill level one, so probably our response is going to be proportionate to that. So we thought, we thought uh, the, the, the other advantage is that the skill level, a lot of these first rockets get you bought by grandparents. Right? <coughs> the certificate is found by the grand, grandparent helping the kid put the rocket together, making the grandparent buy a membership. You can extend that logic down to ready to fly, but then you get into a lot of churn, right? So your grand grandparent buys a uh, ready-to-fly rocket and they sign up the kid for a $25 bar membership and they'll they'll be there for one year you, uh, maybe we'll do that one time but I think I think the strategy we have seems to be working for now so. Jonathan. Uh, I just want to mention something I think is a great benefit especially for new members and that's the member guidebook I think that really is amazing and the for someone who's looking for value from the NAR, if they're not a member of a section, I think that really is a great resource. Okay. So I commend the people who put that together. So we have, we are in the process of doing the final uh, review of the next issue, which has to be printed, um, probably printed next week, I think, or be sent to the tournament. Um, and we've, we've revised it probably 25% of the content is due. So, so content as we cycle it out, but the article, because it's only 56 or 64 pages, you have to, so what we couldn't fit in there, it's gonna be on the website. And we will talk at narrow about whether we should put the guidebook on the website in the members only section as well. We'd we'll like to have it online. Um, speaking of the guidebook, I know competition is kind of, we wanna get that out there. Is there any uh, information about NAR rocket competition in the member guidebook, just even just a blurb? Yes, indeed. The new guidebook has a wonderful article written by somebody in this room about NAR competition. Trip did that, thank you. And the uh, and it'll have a link to the competition guidebook uh, on the web, which is fabulous. I mean, 
everything you'd ever want to know about how to fly a, a payload is on the web. Well, not everything, but a lot of stuff. So, we'll, yes, we're doing that. And it will still be relevant in the new uh, application framework if we move that to the um, edition of Yes, sir. Is there any way or thought to open the motor cater Cato data so that people can look at it? Because I know you're saying, well, if it's st statistically significant, you'll contact the manufacturer. But I don't know that I've hardly ever seen a recall. I know on the forums, you know, there's several people that have had issues. You get, you know, five or ten people with the same motor code, but I never hear anything happening significantly from the organization. It'd be nice to just see it, and I know you've probably got worries about you know, the manufacturer is getting concerned about well, visibility, yeah. right? Um, but, so but it's a transparency kind of thing, too. Right? In, it, it's, it sort of is transparency, but um, I'm a statistician in real life, um, and at least one of my jobs. Um, and I'm really hesitant to put up data that I know is not statistically useful. So, we accumulate it over the course of years and years, it becomes more useful, but it's until we get people really using that site um, at a significantly higher level. If you, if you ask Estes, you know, here, there are 10 Estes motors here from the last year that showed up on our site. How many uh, warranty things did you do? Is it comparable? No, <laughs> they laugh. Um, so I, it's not even a good sample of the kind of chaos between that and the, and the uh, manufacturer privacy, not manufacturer uh, concerns about proprietary information, that sort of thing. We tell them, they tell you if they think there's an issue. I, I wonder too, is there, you know, people don't see anything coming out of that and then they just don't bother, right? I mean, there, there, there's some of that too, I think. That, so. Well, yeah, there is a little bit of a chicken and egg. Yeah. So there have been a couple of occasions where we are privately communicated to a manufacturer that we have had an exceptionally large number. There's a threshold uh, on this particular bot batch of this motor, and action has been taken by the manufacturer as a result of that. Sometimes they were already taking it. Sometimes we were the incentive for them to take it. But it's not inconsequential, but it's only been over high, all the time that I was on the board two or three, two or three times. Where there was really enough reports of the same lot of the same motor that it stood out as yep, there is a problem. And sure enough, there was the manufacturer confirmed it. And, and they made you. And, and then the publicity was the manufacturer then started saying things publicly, so the inducement was in some cases in our data. But, uh, but the, the manufacturers are the ones who ought to be saying public things about it. And the NAR has to sometimes go to them to do so. But it has happened. Really, the cops were more like the friendly community service officers. Other questions? Yes, sir. Another question is comment of feedback. Uh, want to encourage folks to get in touch with your local 4-H folks. I just last week uh, was someplace and happened to be in the office where the it's the Illinois Extension office mm -hmm. in where I am and. I talked to the person there who does the STEM stuff for 4-H, and we had a, I just happened to be there, asked if she was available, had a really great conversation with her, I ended up chatting with her for about an hour, and we're going to see what we can do to Awesome. We have a formal program with them, a formal relationship with them, that has paid some dividends, but you know, the, the original goal was they have fields. We have knowledge about rockets, and maybe we could possibly get together. Um, and I, I think there's been a, a couple of fields that maybe have been identified, but that sure seems to me to be an underutilized aspect of that relationship. So most 4-H groups are working through extension offices at the state level. They're kind of a crazy government agency, so um, they have their own architecture. There might be ag departments in the United States, and at least the ones that have ag. So, yeah, go go talk to them. Find the person that handles disease in Illinois in the county.
County office. Right. And they'll also be really happy to have somebody do aerospace judging at your state yep. fair, county fair, that sort of thing. I've done that for like 14 years in Minnesota. That's always fun. Um, but that's another way. So, oh, so where did you fly this rocket that you brought to the state fair for your ribbon? Oh, I have this big field. My dad loves rockets. And oh, okay. Can I, can I get your name? Interesting follow up. It was years ago when, when I judged one of these things. And one of the popular kits in the advanced group that year was the F 14 Tomcat. And if there were six of them there, I could tell which three had already flown because they had the blood on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> well, they really don't like to fly their 4H projects before the fair. They think that, and I, and I keep telling people, I'd love to see them fly. And if, they, if you brought in a crashed one, I could explain why it crashed. You could still get a purple ribbon. They don't believe me. So. Yes, sir. Uh, I know there is some sort of, sort of at the top level formal agreement or understanding with uh, 4-H. Is that something that's on the web page somewhere or, or that we could point to if we talk to anybody and say, oh, yes, we'll. You know, I don't know. But I can certainly make that happen. And which, you know, just extending that for 4-H, which organizations do we have a relationship and might make that information available for, you know, local outreach? So, yeah. When we did the website transition, there was a 4-H page. I think there's a 4-H page. I just don't know that there's that the, the text of the document. Is that, is that anywhere there? The agreement? Yeah. There was a resource page for 4-H people. That was a source of our... It's still there under the education section. Um, I could probably pull that up. That could run right yeah. <coughs> I, I should make a comment about that 4-H program. The communication throughout the 4-H community is non-existent on that. Uh, the 4-H team that I sponsored that actually won TARC a few years ago actually asked the state organization about it, just looking for additional funds for next year. Right. They had no knowledge of it. Yeah. We, we found that 4-H is not that, within the communication within 4-H is not that straightforward. It's, it's very decentralized. I mean, yeah. they, they operate very much at a local Deep level. Dumps, right. um, and individually at the local level, there is some roll up to the state because their funding comes through the state land grant institutions, but it's it's pretty much decentralized and very much operated locally. Yeah, that makes it sound like anything we have. Yeah. I go back and look at that break page and see if there's at least linked to the document. Somebody wants to know proof that there is a form of it, it, it might not help, but at least it'll say that there's the top, because the, the document basically says, we'll, we'll do what we can to help you, you do what you can to help us, but it doesn't commit money or anything in either direction. It's just a, but it does say our group is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right. We're approved. We have the stamp of 4-H approval. We have on that. Other questions? Going once. Thank you for coming. Thank you for all your participation. Thank you for being so much. We'll collect if you want to jump. If you're going to throw these away anyway, we have another place to put them. So if you want to bring them up here, we'll collect them and reuse them.